Our guests today are the co-authors of one of the seminal books, if you're doing deals, called Corporate Finance and the Securities Law. The sixth edition just came out. And Joe McLaughlin, who's a retired partner at Sidley, very well known in the securities law industry, one of the giants, used to be at Sidley. He's now retired before that. He was at Brown and Wood. He was general counsel Goldman Sachs. And he joined Charles Johnson after Charles had initially written his book many, many years ago. And now Anna Panetto, from partner of Mayor Brown, who's very prolific herself, has joined Joe to be co-authors of the sixth edition. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. So I'm so excited to be here with you, Joe and Anna, the big fans of both of you for different reasons. Joe, for many years at the ABA meetings, I would listen to your counsel and you were always one to express a viewpoint. Not many lawyers these days are willing to do that. And I've always appreciated about that. And Anna, you're, you're just so prolific. You're, you're just out and about writing so much. And now you've joined with Joe on this really important book that's been around forever. Uh, so very excited for that. So what are the, some of the topics that are addressed in this, this, is, this new sixth edition of, of, the, of the book? Well, the uh, sixth edition um, uh, has now been updated by the 2020 update. And the 2020 update was Anna's first, uh, Anna's and my first collaboration together. And I think it went very well. Uh, so in updates, we uh, often include uh, recent developments like rule changes, uh, court decisions, emerging disclosure issues, and so on. But uh, with new additions and with the addition of Anna as co-author, the opportunity comes up for adding some important topics. And uh, what we have done is to add SPACs and uh, uh, reverse mergers to the chapter that previously dealt only with direct listings, but is now uh, titled uh, Alternatives to IPOs. And we had a chapter on pass-through entities, uh, and we've now added to that chapter business development companies. So I think the book, as supplemented by uh, the most recent uh, update, um, is better than it has been before, and we hope it'll continue to get better. And then, Joe, what do you think about the COVID crisis and how the SEC staff and the SEC handled that? Do you think we'll see any more enforcement actions like the Cheesecake Factory case, or are we past that point? Well, COVID is not the first uh, time that a uh, new development has occurred that has affected um, the American um, economy and public companies in general and had important disclosure implications. And all the SEC can really do is to remind people that if they're preparing disclosure uh, in light of a significant development like COVID, they have to uh, take an honest and direct approach. Uh, and that includes not telling one set of people one uh, conclusion, another set of people another conclusion uh, happened or was alleged to have happened in a uh, cheesecake factory um, uh, proceeding. Uh, Chairman Clayton, of course, said that he didn't expect the SEC to be uh, bringing charges against people who made good faith attempt to, attempts to uh, disclose the picture as they saw it. And I don't regard the Cheesecake Factory uh, as a departure from that approach. Uh, again, I think the uh, important element there was uh, a company allegedly telling different people different things. And we've uh, had a lot of uh, reports uh, filed in the meantime. There have been a lot of uh, 10Qs and 10Ks, and there's been a lot of disclosure, and people have a much better idea of uh, the limits of uh, disclosure when it comes to what public, public companies can say. So I don't expect uh, a lot more in the way of uh, enforcement activities. Uh, I think uh, companies are doing a good faith uh, job to uh, disclose the effects of COVID from their point, uh, from their point of view. And, and I know the new book does cover the most recent trends related to IPOs. There's a lot of SPACs. Do you think that the SEC has done enough to promote IPOs in the United States? Well, you said before that I wasn't afraid to uh, express my views and I will um, honor that. I think um, if uh, I were grading um, the former chair, uh, Jay Clayton, on uh, his performance in this particular area, I, I think it'd be a, a pretty low grade. 
His first speech uh, was early in 2017 before the Economic Club of New York, and he made a point of saying that he wanted to encourage more public companies. And at the time, according to a footnote in his speech, there were 43 uh, listed companies in the United States, 4,300 listed companies. And that number has actually gone down. Uh, so he hasn't got a lot to show for his efforts uh, during his tenure. And uh, this is a long-term uh, trend that uh, the incoming chair should be concerned about because as Chairman Clayton said, if public investors don't have access to uh, public companies, uh, that has long-term potentially negative implications for our economy and our society. Uh, now, to some degree, uh, the JOBS Act, uh, which made it possible for companies to um, have much uh, larger numbers of uh, record holders and still avoid uh, being required to file reports with the SEC, uh, in some respects, that uh, is uh, the reason why some companies stay private longer. Uh, but during uh, the Clayton SEC, uh, the SEC did spend an awful lot of time promoting exempt offerings. Uh, and it remains a mystery why the Clayton SEC did not even consider what could potentially be the most uh, important thing the SEC could do to encourage IPOs which is to extend the safe harbor for forward-looking statements that is in the 1995 legislation to IPOs. Uh, and Congress made it very clear back in 1995 that the SEC uh, ought to consider doing so. Joe, I think it's also worth um, noting that Clayton um, did not look at the research rules and hopefully um, Gensler might take the opportunity to do so. You know, when I talk to a lot of smaller and mid cap companies, one of the concerns that they have, and this is particularly true for life sciences companies, is that um, even after they go public, um, they might be abandoned or find themselves with very little by way of, of research analyst coverage. So um, even after um, taking the leap and, and choosing um, to, to go public, they might not really enjoy all the advantages that we might you know, historically have associated with, um, with being a public company if they don't really have um, sufficient or, or um, meaningful um, research coverage. And, and the SEC has not, um, obviously it's a complex issue, but the SEC could could play a very meaningful part in, in rationalizing um, the research rules and, and has just kind of failed to do that. And I think that's an important part of sort of the whole IPO, um, the IPO framework. And it's just been ignored for a really long time. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think it's, it's, um, it's an issue. And even for some of the companies that are going public by merging with SPAC, it will be an issue. Well, you're exactly right. And there is a section in chapter one of the book um, that uh, is captioned, uh, the future of the 1933 act. And one of the points it makes is that the um, uh, public companies have suffered from a lack of uh, cell side research uh, which has largely disappeared for many reasons, uh, but um, uh, is important to a company's decision to engage in an IPO. And then Joe, when it comes to direct listings, what do you think about the SEC's approval of that, of the New York Stock Exchange's rule change, particularly when it comes to section 11 liability? Well, I was very surprised. Uh, the uh, Council on Institutional Investors, which is not an organization that, um, I generally uh, agree with on many issues, uh, did uh, ask the SEC to postpone uh, delaying the uh, approval of the New York Stock Exchange rule that would have allowed a company to engage in a direct listing and at the same time uh, sell primary shares uh, to the public. And the, uh, the council uh, said until the SEC fixes the problem of uh, a litigant being able to trace shares um, 
to the registration statement used for the IPO uh, from the direct listing uh, that uh, the SEC should not uh, proceed. Now, uh, there's litigation going on right now in California in the Ninth Circuit involving the SLAC technologies direct listing where SLAC is trying to dismiss a Section 11 claim on the grounds that the plaintiffs have not shown, showed that they bought shares traceable to the registration statement. So direct listings have this vulnerability, but I will add that uh, so do other types of offerings. Uh, look at your ATM offerings, your at-the-market offerings, where a, an investment banker is asked to act as agent for the company and sell registered shares into the public market. But uh, this is like injecting um, a, a dye into a fire hose uh, with a syringe, because there's no way that people who buy on any given day uh, can uh, show that they bought registered shares. Uh, it is a, uh, a problem that uh, becomes uh, greater uh, when the company is selling shares uh, directly along with um, uh, stockholders who are selling shares. Uh, the SEC should pay attention to the issue because I think sooner or later it will attract Congress's attention. Good stuff, Joe. And then and in the context of a merger with SPAC, there's an issue about the ability to freely discuss projections. Do you think if the safe harbor for forward-looking statements was tinkered with, it, it might solve the issue? Well, I think the problem with SPAC projections is that some people think they're overly aggressive because they have the benefit of the safe harbor, um, yeah. whereas, whereas IPOs don't. So uh, sure, you could fix the uh, you could fix the IPO problem by extending the safe harbor to IPOs, but that doesn't uh, cure uh, the problem if there is one. The SPACs uh, are making overly optimistic projections uh, when they uh, plan to do their de-SPAC uh, de transaction. I, I think that's right. You know, to to expand on on um, what Joe was saying, <clears throat> I think there's. Um, Right now, um, there is a perception, Brock, that um, there is uh, much greater freedom um, for companies, for private companies that are contemplating um, going public um, to communicate um, in the context of a merger um, with a SPAC um, by combining with a SPAC than, than they would have um, to communicate if they were undertaking an IPO because they can um, include these projections, whether um, it's in the context of talking to, to pipe investors when um, they're marketing the, the pipe that almost inevitably accompanies a, a de-SPAC process these days, the SPAC pipe. Um, but, um, and, and so, and a lot of the companies that we're seeing um, go public through um, through mergers with SPACs are companies that are um, in sectors that um, are very much dependent on um, on future growth. So whether that's companies that are in the electric vehicle sector or companies that are in um, the satellite or um, uh, other uh, aerospace um, sector. Um, where um, they, the the premise is is really um, the valuation is based on on future growth and clearly there's there's no current revenue, so those projections are immensely valuable in terms of um, getting to the valuations. Um, I think there's a lot of emphasis placed by institutional investors and by the bankers on the ability to to use those projections. Um, I think we're now kind of at the cusp of the, the SPAC um, craze. And I think we're starting to, to see, you know, sort of murmurings about SPAC litigation. And we're starting to see sort of the beginning of um, what is, um, you know, the, some of the, the first um, set of companies that completed their um, their mergers with SPACs, having announced their earnings post SPAC um, SPAC merger, and maybe not having um, not having met the the projections. So it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. Um, would 
things be different um, if uh, we could use projections in the context of IPOs, if, you know, instead of um, projections and models solely being shared with, um, with research analysts in the context of an IPO, if those were shared um, broadly and, and included in prospectuses, you know, would, would that sort of fix the communications issues that, that bankers and that private companies um, perceive? You know, I don't know. Is that something that we're likely to see addressed during this, um, the Gensler, you know, Gensler tenure? I, I doubt um, that um, that's likely to, to be taken up. I agree. And, and what about, it seems as the years, as I get older, the years send, <laughs> seem to meld together. So it seems like the SEC is amending the accredited investor definition all the time, although I know that's not true. But do you foresee more changes coming soon? Well, um, there were there were clearly some, um, some divisions among the commissioners when um, when the amendments were adopted to the accredited investor definition. And um, there were some um, concerns raised that the commission perhaps should have considered um, modifying, <coughs> pardon me, modifying um, the net worth and um, the income thresholds. And, and perhaps, you know, um, it was that that would have been the opportunity to do so. So maybe we'll see something there. I don't think that we'll see many other um, substantive changes to um, to the accredited investor definition. I think we've probably seen um, the most significant changes um, that we're going to see for for some time to to the definition, and probably to a lot of the exempt offering. Um, to the exempt offering framework, I suspect. And that's just, just my view, of course. Well, I agree. Uh, it, it's a difficult area because if you make the definition uh, more restrictive, then people will complain that uh, small investors are being deprived of the opportunity to invest in private placements. If you go the other way, uh, people will complain about uh, the potential for fraud. So the SEC has to navigate this, and it's a treacherous channel. So, Joe, what, you know, during the prior administration, obviously some of the Democratic commissioners opposed a number of rule changes. Now that we have a, a new SEC chair coming in, you know, you, the exempt offering framework you touched upon. Do you think there might be other rollbacks of rulemakings, or is that too difficult to pull off? Well, it's a really fascinating area, uh, Brock, because uh, back in December. Uh, Maxine Waters, who is now the uh, chair of the House Committee on Financial Services, uh, sent uh, uh, then President elect Biden a uh, letter uh, in which she used the word rescind 78 times. Uh, so she has um, a long list of things that she thinks the administration, uh, whether through the SEC or other uh, means, uh, should roll back. Uh, so uh, uh, Chairman Gensler, when he gets confirmed, uh, will have a lot of political backing uh, to um, uh, roll back much of uh, what the uh, Clayton SEC uh, accomplished. But, uh, you know, it's not that easy. Uh, an agency uh, has to uh, proceed carefully and uh, within the um, procedural and substantive guidelines of the Administrative Procedure Act. It takes time to build a case uh, why a rule adopted just recently uh, ought to be overturned. Uh, if, if you do uh, overturn the rule, then you're, uh, there's a potential for litigation uh, based on uh, al allegations that the commission has acted arbitrarily and capriciously. So uh, it takes up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, Anna and I did a presentation uh, not long ago uh, in which we uh, talked about more than 20 uh, Clayton Commission initiatives that have been adopted by a three to two or three to one uh, vote. And um, uh, it, it's just not clear to me that the SEC has enough bandwidth to uh, go back and revisit all those issues when there is a lot more to be done. Yeah, I've never seen an acting chair be so active. And then we actually even have an acting corp fin director, which in my career, I don't remember ever having someone in that role. But um, maybe I'm forgetting. 
Uh -huh. Well, certainly not for as long as it seems, it, it, not for as long as we've had this acting chair, I, I think. I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I join you. I can't remember having an acting chair for as long as we've had um, the current acting chair and certainly not one that has been as active in, in the role. And then, Anna, what about the disclosure effectiveness changes that we, we've gotten? Is, do you think that the ad initiative was helpful in modernizing the disclosures? You know, really around the edges, yes, um, but, but only around the edges. Um, you know, I, I think that um, certain of the changes, um, for example, those relating to MDNA, um, which were adopted most recently, um, were perhaps the most helpful in terms of, of modernizing and really perhaps making a difference. But um, if you look at the changes relating to um, risk factors um, or uh, business um, or various of the other changes uh, relating to um, other aspects of uh, Regulation SK, they were mostly just tinkering um, or, or really eliminating duplicative um, or outdated, um, outdated rules and didn't really sort of take advantage of the opportunity to affect real change. We still have disclosure documents that by and large are um, very long and um, don't um, reflect the way that most investors um, absorb information these days. And um, it's, um, there have been numerous studies um, conducted by the SEC, many in the context of um, 40 Act um, documents, and, and some um, undertaken in connection with um, the SEC's analysis of regulation best interest in terms of how investors read or, or look at um, uh, information about investments and um, how they analyze uh, information and you know, financial literacy um, studies and you know what they what they all go to show is that um, investors look at information or absorb information best when it's presented sort of in a layered format and when information is presented graphically and when information is um, presented in a way where um, there's a summary prospectus some you know, things that have been adopted in, in um, some cases uh, in a connection with mutual fund disclosure and so on. So I feel like um, the Disclosure Effectiveness Initiative has been helpful certainly, but, but just hasn't gone far enough. And okay. having written a few treatises myself, I know that once you're done, you're so happy, but you're already thinking about the next edition because you're taking notes and now with everything always changing so fast, are you already starting to think about what that next edition might include that? that we, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's too early to say, of course, in, in some cases, um, but certainly um, there will be more on SPACs and more on direct listings. Um, there will certainly be um, additional discussion on, um, on IPOs since there've been um, some interesting developments on um, on how um, IPOs, you know, how IPOs are, are being priced in terms of more auction based pricing, um, and uh, of course, you know, hard to ignore um, the focus, uh, the ESG, climate change, human capital focus. Um, so those are some of the things we're we're thinking about um, green bonds, sustainability linked bonds. Um, so uh, always keeping current. Um, yeah, because the list is always endless. It's crazy. Yeah. 
but you know, I one of the things that I always admired about um, the the Johnson uh, McLaughlin treatise was that it was very much a, a treatise that focused on on doing deals, and um, I could go to it and um, and and really um, find information on transactions that were of the moment, and so we hope to to keep that. Yeah, if you're out there doing deals, this is the book to have, the seminal book. And thank you so much, Joe, for, for doing such great work for over the years. And congratulations to getting Anna to join the team. I, I, I'm very happy that uh, Anna has joined the team. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.